Hey everybody, welcome back for part three of the parallax occlusion mapping series. Uh, today I wanted to talk about shadows. So I have set up a um, second mesh here on the right. This is a polygon mesh with um, about two, uh, 1 million vertices and 2 million triangles. So if we go into our wireframe mode, um, you can see here the uh, Mesh is extremely dense, uh, is not using Nanite right now, but obviously it easily could. Um, the purpose, of course, is to show you that uh, we have some shadows being cast and that those shadows add quite a lot of depth to the image that our parallax occlusion mapping here on the right is lacking, even though it has the same um, depth on the displacement. So we'll be talking a little bit about the function here inside parallax occlusion mapping. So <clears throat> the first thing you're going to need to do is hook up a static pool or pool parameter to the render shadows occlusion mapping here. Check the box to set that's true. Uh, we'll need to supply it with a light vector of some kind. And then it also has parameters to define the number of steps. This works similar to the steps up here. Uh, the penumbra defines how soft or hard the shadows are. And um, transfer to vertex normal, I believe, has to do with um, decal functions. Um, so we won't be using that. Um, so moving on here, once you've enabled your bool, we need a light vector. So we can either use a... Uh, point light by feeding it a material parameter collection or some value uh, of a vector 3 and comparing that to our world position. And then if we take the difference, this will give us a vector, a light vector between these two points, right? And you could use that uh, to make a point light. I like to use the atmosphere sunlight vector. Uh, you'll find that you need to multiply it by negative 1. And for now, we'll leave the shadow steps the same. I've just set the number to 1.5. And then you need to take the shadow output and multiply that by your base color. So now, right out the gate, we can see that we have something resembling shadows. And this may be good enough for a lot of people right out the gate that you can kind of just stop here, depending on your application. But you're going to run into a couple of problems. First is if we go over here, you'll notice that um, on this cube with the um, parallax occlusion mapping, the faces here are way too dark on the size of the cube, whereas here on one without parallax occlusion mapping, the vertex shading is accurate. And the reason for that is that the vertex shading is darkening these faces, then the parallax occlusion mapping shadow is darkening these faces because it's determining that they are not uh, visible to our light vector and it's com completely turning them black. So we need to fade the effect out uh, depending on the direction that the face is pointing. So if it's, you know, if it's away from, if it wouldn't be visible by the light, we need to turn off the shadow since it's already going to be in shadow. Um, and there's a couple of other things that we can do to improve the visual quality and the performance. So um, the next thing that we're going to want to do, if we come down in and we look at the shadows, so here on the real shadows, just note that they're pretty crisp and dark, um, but they're not pitch black. If we come over to parallax occlusion mapping shadows, you'll notice that they're not very dark. Uh, and if anything, it kind of just looks like uh, mud, maybe. Like it doesn't really look like a shadow. And the reason for that is because of the specular. Uh, true shadows will shadow specular as well as the color. So if we grab our shadow, we plug that into our specular value as well. Now our shadows are actually shadowing. It doesn't look muddy anymore, but it also kind of looks too dark. Um, so we'll have to find a way to lighten it back up again. The next thing I like to do is um, 
kind of bring back some of the specular in areas that are, are already shaded. Because again, if we look at this sort of thing, um, the, the faces that are pointing away from the light vector, their specular was already reduced by the vertex lighting. Uh, and I don't want to double up on that reduction. So I will grab the dot product of the pixel normal and our light vector and um, invert it. And then we are going to get something that looks like, uh, let's see, like this, right? Um, it doesn't show the normal map here on the pixel normal for some reason. But um, then uh, we are going to grab our shadow and take the difference here. And we'll get something that looks like this and saturate that. We're dividing it by two because specular's default value is 0.5, not one. So we want this to be in the grays, not the whites, when we plug it into our specular. So if we apply this, you probably, I'm not sure that you'll be able to see this all that much, but if you look at areas that are already um, kind of on the edge of darkness, they should regain some of their specular. Uh, so next here, I wanted to talk about brightening it up a little bit. And the way that I'm going to do that is by looking at the dot product of the vertex normal and the sun vector. Once again, getting the one minus because we want here black on the top, white on the edges. Um, I'm using a power node just to increase the contrast of this shift. Um, and then we're going to add the shadow map to that, giving us this. And look a little less weird on a cube. But you'll notice that now these faces that are not you know, so if this is the sun vector, we're looking at the, here from this an angle of the sun. If we come around here to the opposite side, uh, this is not in shadow anymore. If I get rid of this, that would have been in shadow, uh, which technically it should be, right? But it's already being shaded once again by the vertex shader. So we need to bring that back and get rid of the shading from our um, from our pixel, or excuse me, from our parallax occlusion mapping. It won't look proper on all shapes, like for example here, just with a um, you know a sphere, it's not going to look properly. But you're generally not going to use a sphere for parallax occlusion mapping anyway. It's typically going to be restricted to either flat or mostly flat shapes. So this should work well. And then we're going to use that as a lerp between some default minimum value. In this case, I'm choosing 0.8 uh, or 0 0.08 rather instead of 0, right? So 0 0.08 will bring back some of uh, the light get, you know, so that it's not quite in total darkness. The idea is we need to simulate some of that skylight, some ambient light in these um, areas of shadow. They're not going to be pitch black. So now if we come over here to kind of here where we have some uh, true shadows here on the right and our fake shadows here on the left. And this is going into a named reroute node that I've just got up here as a shortcut. So it's not crossing the whole material. We're going to multiply that instead. Now we brought back some of that brightness. Our shadow is not quite so dark. So at this point, it's looking pretty natural. And if we go to our directional light here and we start moving things around, you can see we're getting a pretty good result. Um, it's not perfect, especially as the sun gets to really steep angles. Uh, you know, the, the coloration isn't an exact match, uh, but you can further tweak this uh, as well, and we will do a little more, uh, but this is a good spot. So the next thing I want to talk about is the steps, right? So obviously here's with a default of 16, um, but once again, the steps, they work fundamentally the same as our main parallax occlusion depth function does. So why would we want to use a fixed 16 steps, right? We can we can actually see those steps here. If I um, go in and plug that in, and let's uh, let's go unlit. We look at here on our map as I 
increase the steps, you can see them move into place, right? And uh, eventually, so at 30, so it will say 16 steps, it looks pretty rough in some areas. Step artifacts are pretty visible. Uh, at 32, now it's starting to look pretty accurate and very few step artifacts. 64, this is kind of where you're going to see pretty diminishing returns going beyond this. And then 128, very few areas benefited from that at all, right? So here it did, but overall, um, pretty good. So, um, you know, that obviously has some useful results, but it begs the question of if, you know, if we can take advantage of inconsistent step counts here on our parallax, why not do the same thing with our steps rather than just cranking the step quantity up to get rid of these artifacts? Why don't we instead reuse our dithering and take some values and interpolate between them and uh, enter those for our shadow steps. So try this. And so now you'll see we don't have any shadow step artifacts. It, uh, and as an added bonus, we're also getting kind of a bit of soft shadowing. The softness of the shadow is going to depend on the, um, the exact values that you use here. If they're very different from each other, uh, you'll get kind of softer shadows. So keep that in mind. This is obviously not physically accurate, but uh, it's a pretty good representation. Uh, and then further, you can adjust the number. You'll see how this kind of affects the softness as well. So find a value you like here, I'll go with 1.5. Um, but uh, there's another optimization we can make as well. So rather than reducing the sample qu quantity by uh, dithering, we can also reduce it based off of angle. Because once again here, with the normal parallax, when we're looking at it from above, we're going to go to the min steps. When we come down at these steep angles, it's going to switch over to the max steps. With light, we can do the same thing. When the direction of the sun is pointing uh, downward, um, perpendicular to the surface, we don't really need very many samples. As the sun, you know, if the camera was the sun, moves down to the, the edge, becomes planar, then we need a higher quantity of samples to achieve the look. So we can do that once again, reusing our dot product from our vertex normals as our alpha. Uh, basically saying, okay, uh, you know, these areas that are, you know, directly in the light use a low number of samples. And as we move around to the edge, uh, use a high number of samples. So we'll draw, use this to drive a LERP where one is kind of our high value that we set and we'll say 22 and 18. And then we're going to divide that by something, say for example, two and then use this for our stat shadow steps. And so now, as we move our light, when it's up here perpendicular, it's going to take little to no steps. But as we move it out into the steep angles, it will take more steps. And then again, as it gets to be where uh, it's at, you know, 360 degrees here, it's not going to have any. Um, any effect at all because we're going to completely lerp it out. So this gives us a pretty good um, quality to performance ratio here. And if we turn back on our lighting, you know, we're still pretty close to our ground truth, especially when the sun is high in the sky. When it gets really steep, we might be a little over dark but we're nowhere near as over dark as we were before. So um, I think that covers the majority of it. There are a few pitfalls I wanted to talk about as well. Uh, I think the biggest one is just that if we take the sun and we move it like this, you'll find that we still have issues with overshadowing, right? So here on the actual physical mesh, uh, areas that are in 
uh, occluded against the directional light obviously aren't going to be casting shadows from the directional light uh, because they're already in shadow. So this looks correct. Whereas over here, these areas that are in shadow against the direct light are still also casting shadows uh, themselves incorrectly, leading to an excessive amount of shadows being applied here on the um, areas that are in shadow. And there isn't very there isn't a very good way to fix this that I can think of um, because with deferred rendering, uh, the shadows are drawn later in the rendering pipeline, and the material doesn't have any way of really knowing if it's in shadow or not, unless you go out of your way to uh, find a way to feed it that data through extra computation, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of making you know this sort of thing high performance in the first place. So um, this is kind of an unsolvable problem right now, as far as I'm aware. If anybody has a good idea, uh, definitely throw it in the comments. But ultimately, I think that the depth that you get from having the shadows enabled in cases like this is worth the um, you know the issues of having maybe too few uh, shadows in uh, or excuse me too too little light too, too much shadow in other cases. So um, last thing I wanted to check in on I guess is we'll hop back over to our stat GPU. Let's uh, hide this and then move our sun up here. This is with 64 samples on the um, main uh, parallax occlusion mapping dithered with 32. And we are getting a base pass here of one millisecond. And if we come up here, we're getting a base pass of 0.4. And then if we grab that directional light, maybe put it at a fairly steep angle, base pass is going to go up a little bit, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. And then as we go to the steep angle here, we're still 1.1. .1. So all in all, pretty good. Because again, remember, when we started this, um, uh, series, we were already over one millisecond when we were sampling the um, the anisotropic filtered texture. So we still haven't really even exceeded the performance that we lost, um, or it used to be that we regained from uh, the first episode's optimizations. And we already have a very good looking, fully shadowed uh, parallax occlusion mapping that can essentially rival uh, in most lighting conditions the true uh, plane. I would recommend when you're authoring this sort of content that you have a um, you know a polygon mesh reference to see how the light shadow acts so that you can get responding properly into different lighting conditions. Uh, but uh, that I think should be all for this one. Uh, thanks for watching and see you next time.